scriptures talk about a blessedness that happens to a man whose delight is in the law of God. So as someone says, it says, but his delight is in the law of God. And doth he meditate day and night. He says that that man is like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose leaves do not wither, when he bears fruit in every season. As you are about listening to this message, we believe that your life is going to be like that man planted by the rivers of water. Your leaves are forever going to bear. And we know that your, your season will not pass by. You will forever shine and you will forever bear fruit. We have a lot of content to share with you. So we would entreat you to subscribe to this channel as well as like us. Hit that notification bell to receive more updates from us because we know that whatever content here is going to set you on calls at every time. It's going to make you attain whatever stature that Christ wants you to attain. Thank you. I've been so blessed already just, um, just sitting here and soaking in the glory from um, Dr. Lumide Manuel's session. I just met a little just a five or so minutes and it was such an amazing time and then the worship again may the Lord do us good this morning in Jesus name again I remind you that conferences like this essentially grant us access to light because in this kingdom we arise and we shine only to the degree to which we obtain light it says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. So when we are bankrupt of light, it is impossible to be able to rise to that prophetic position that God intends for us. Hallelujah. I have profound regard and respect for any ministry that invests in the teaching of the word, because the only way believers grow is through the word. Hallelujah and that from a child thou hast known the holy scripture which is able to make you wise even unto salvation he says and now i commend you to god and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified hallelujah praise the name of the lord so yesterday we began to discuss um, two dimensions of Jesus Christ that we said were important for the efficiency of the believer. We looked at Jesus as Savior and then we looked at Jesus as King. Just a two or three minutes recap for the sake of those who are just connecting. And we said that there are a number of differences in those dimensions. For instance, when we deal with Jesus as Savior, the entire work of Jesus as Savior is captured in what we call the gospel of salvation. That is a revelation of his substitutionary sacrifice towards man and creation. And that when we reveal Jesus as Savior, man is revealed as a helpless person who is unable to attain unto a position of righteousness by himself. Are we together? man does absolutely nothing except to receive that which has been finished but then when we move to jesus as king the scenario changes jesus is now not just someone who is going to die he's an exalted king seated on a throne and man is no longer the weak helpless person but is now number one a son in the kingdom the son of the king and number two an ambassador are we together and we did say that we have a twofold mandate when we discuss jesus as king number one our mandate to the king we have an obligation to the king and number two we have a mandate from the king to the nations are we still together and we discussed that our mandate to the king is complete loyalty surrender and obedience as simple as it sounds it will take the engracing of the spirit for you to be able to do that hallelujah 
to get to a point where you can say nevertheless not my will but yours be done and i did tell us that when we deal with jesus as savior the gift is the same to everyone regardless who you are it is the gift of life eternal from the worst sinner to the most self-righteous person you you are given the same gift but when we now begin to discuss kingdom there are rewards you don't talk of rewards when you deal with jesus as savior everything there is a gift but when you come to the kingdom there are rewards and that those rewards are according to the degree to which you are submissive you are surrendered and obedient i was so blessed hearing um um, Dr. Lumide Emanuel discourse on Deuteronomy talking about obedience Deuteronomy 28 for instance from verse 1 and 2 it says it shall come to pass if thou shalt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all that I command you this day that you shall be exalted above all the nations of the earth and then that these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you there is a condition it says if you be willing and obedient the bible says you shall eat the good of the land every land has good but your portion is delivered to you at the instance of obedience are we together the creed the law the modus operandi in the kingdom is obedience in fact in one word faith is defined as obedience that means whatever it is that you do in this kingdom if it does not translate to loyalty surrender and obedience then you are not going to get any reward in this kingdom and you will impede your own growth so i did tell us that there are rewards in this kingdom and then that we have our mandate and obligation to the king not just to worship him your worship is simply an expression of loyalty an expression of surrender and an expression of obedience are we together now this morning i want to discuss just to continue from where we left off that we have a mandate from the king so when you meet the king when you're done doing business with the king he leaves you with an assignment he leaves you with a mandate from him to the nations this is very powerful so you know responsible kingdom citizens because any one of them who claims to have met the king will always live with an assignment to the nations there is no one who meets the king and just says well i just worshiped him i love the king no if you meet the king there will be an assignment given to you we call it different names we call it purpose we call it kingdom advancement but it is the the mandate this is the desire from the heart of the king and like it was in isaiah chapter 6 when you read the bible says in the year that king uzziah died i isaiah saw the lord remember he says that he was high and lifted up then he began to describe that the train of his robe filled the temple there's no point discussing this but in ancient times the royalty of the king was also seen by the extent of his train so when he says the train of his robe filled the temple it was an attempt to describe the extent of majesty are we together and when isaiah saw him isaiah broke down and said woe is me for i am undone he called himself a man of unclean lips and that i dwell amidst the people of unclean lips the bible says one of the seraphs took a live coal and touched his lips and says your iniquity has been rolled away from you and then there was a call in heaven it says who shall we send and who shall go for us and isaiah said here am i send me this one is not a savior discussion this is the king desiring that something be done to the nations and a man is availing himself every time you see loyalty every time you see surrender and every time you see obedience you will always see power and you will always see results please do not forget this it is a modus operandi in the kingdom if you ever find power without loyalty obedience and surrender proceed and um, preceding it it is witchcraft you can simply test the genuineness of spiritual power by using the index of loyalty to god surrender to the king 
and obedience if you find these tripartite expressions preceding the manifestations of power and results it is authentic from God it is impossible to have access to genuine spiritual power that was obtained from the king by his spirit in the absence of loyalty the absence of surrender and the absence of obedience are we together hallelujah praise the name of the Lord so our mandate from the king please write if you're writing our mandate from the king Jesus as king now is to be an extension please write our mandate from the king is to be an extension of his wisdom an extension of his power an extension of his glory to the nations of the earth the bible simply describes us with respect to the king and his agenda as ambassadors and as witnesses this is a very important concept you must understand our mandate from the king is to be an extension of his wisdom to be an extension of his power to be an extension of his glory to the nations hallelujah this is what it means to be an ambassador this is what it means to be a witness now theologically speaking believers are classified twofold when we describe believers theologically speaking we describe believers number one according to identity and number two according to function when believers are classified according to identity the bible uses descriptions like heirs of god joint heirs with christ are we together in john 15 he says i am the vine and ye are the branches so when the bible describes believers according to identities it seeks to show the extent of our oneness with christ our union with god are we together but then the bible also describes believers according to function this is where it now begins to use descriptions like you are the salt of the earth matthew chapter 5 from verse 13 and then he says you are the light of the world you see that now he calls us ambassadors he calls us kings and priests according to revelations 5 and verse 10 that we have been made unto our god kings and priests and we shall reign in the earth the bible calls us um, light and salt when you read matthew chapter 5 jesus teaching from verse 13 to 16 verse 16 says so then let your light so shine before men that they might see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven when it has to do with believers described based on their function you would see that god seems to be passionate about believers producing a certain kind of results because he's been glorified is tied to the excelling of the believers for instance in john chapter 15 and verse 8 the bible says hearing is my father glorified when ye bear much fruit he says so shall you be my disciples verse 16 of the same chapter says ye have not chosen me but i have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide or remain are we bible students so he desires that he be glorified every time there are results every time believers excel in the kingdom when they become an extension of his power and of his glory all of the multifaceted dimensions that are captured in the king do you know the book of esther when you read the book of esther the book of esther is a prophetic adumbration an adumbration is a foreshadow an acting of something that will actually happen are we together you notice that the reason why Vashti was banished was because she forgot that her assignment there was to be a reflection of the king's glory. Now she had her own agenda and it was customary for the kings to flaunt their wives, their treasures, their army. And he now said that Vashti would come and present herself before his friends. And she embarrassed him, disappointed him. She had her own agenda. 
And the king, being a good man, did not drive her. He sought counsel from the elders. And they said, better drive this woman out of this kingdom. If you don't drive her, she's going to create a pattern that is inconsistent with your will. She will use her influence to make other women to start doing that too. And the king heeded to the advice and drove her away. This is an adumbration. When Esther came, remember, Esther also wanted to fall into that trap. And Mordecai reminded her. He said, don't forget that you are here with an agenda. She goes to meet the king, even though not invited. And by favor, the king lifts the golden sense and says, come in. What do you want? If she said, I want your friend, her man, dead, they would have thrown her too. But notice how she approached him. She said, I, I'm here to flaunt your glory. I want to put a celebration for you to honor you. And the king said, this is, this is exceptional. This is what I've been looking for. Are you getting the idea now? I'm here because of you. I want to serve you. I want, I want the nations to see the extent that you are king over 127 provinces. And would you grant me the permission to invite everybody, including your very good friend, Haman? Are we together? And so that celebration happened and the king's glory was so flaunted, he called her and said, repeat this again. Repeat this again. When she had proven her loyalty, when the king was no longer in doubt of her loyalty, she now met him and said, I have a request. And he said, say it. Whatever is your request, you have sorted. Now I, I mean, it's not easy finding a woman like you. Now that I have secured your trust, what do you want? He said, there is a man who is threatening my people. Who is that? Her man. Ah, her man is my friend, oh but you are my wife what do we do now and the bible says a very wise king he entered the garden to think you see eh, when the realm of the spirit is against you he now came to beg her and the man came and caught him the king caught him around his wife and said on top of what i was discussing i've seen you doing no you are you are you are it's over for you he was begging how did i get here I'm discussing, <laughs> are we together? But you get my point now? That in this kingdom, you see, this Christianity of always approaching him, you're the line of tribe of Jews, he knows that you are just beating around the bush and say, God, I'm here again. This is my issue. You see that you are not, you are blind. You are powerful, but it looks like you are not seen. You see, those kinds of Christians never go far. But there are people who step in and, Lord, I'm available, I'm here for you. You use the wisdom of Esther. And the moment, listen, listen, the moment the king sees in experience that your heart and your life is all about his agenda, there is nothing he will not give you, including the things you did not ask for. This is a powerful secret. Our mandate, listen, is to be up and about becoming extensions of the king. Many of you here, this is, I mean, this is a ministry that is very strong in empowerment, especially financially. I know that many of you here own businesses. Let me ask you a question. When you want to downsize for whatever reason, what is the chief parameter that you will use in downsizing people? Inefficiency. Am I right on that? If you have a staff structure of, say, 50 people, and for whatever reason you want to downsize and take away five or ten people, if you are fair and just and honest, you will use the index of inefficiency. Who is in this company who has been taken from us? and does not look like your contribution is significant and you may have to relieve them is that true all i want is for you for you to be glorified for you to be lifted all i want is for you for you to be glorified, for you to be lifted. One more time. All I want is for you, for you to be glorified, for you to be lifted. Listen, there are people who donate themselves willingly and say, Lord, if for any reason you are looking for a man, I may not seem like much, 
but one thing you can count on me is that I'm available you would see weak and ordinary people but there will be mighty people that God will use and sometimes you wonder and add everything and the equation does not add up because you see whoever is committed to serving the purposes of the king is the one who secures his interest there are no biases he loves everybody but he's only committed to those who are sincere and available to serve his purposes now this is the dimension of the kingdom that many believers do not know and so many believers do not know that the king himself has a desire the king himself has an agenda have you ever tried serving a rich man when a rich man in our world today when a rich man says I'm testy you will run with your own money you will not say sir can I have the money you will run with because you you know what you are doing even if you are a businessman you will run with your own money and go and buy it and serve him because if that man reaches into his pocket he will bless you according to his riches not according to what you have done he will bless you according to his perception of what you have done that same man can look at you and say you're a responsible gentleman what do you do he say well just manage it see me tomorrow and that's the end of it are we together yes so those who look like they are great in this kingdom are not great because they earned anything in themselves they are simply people who have become foolish enough to listen not just to reach for the hand of the king but to reach for the heart of the king what is it that you desire oh god even listen even in our world today i hope i'm blessing someone even in our world today when you find someone who is not after your money or your influence but is genuinely after your heart it almost becomes a charm like relationship you find out that it, that person may even be your house help and you get closer to that person sometimes even than your physical children when you want to give some money to keep you love your children but you you suspect that you, they, you, they, you can't take them to police station you can't sue them to court and they are aware so you now trust somebody come my dear daughter can you keep this for me and now sometimes they wonder and say what kind of unfair thing is this we are the children of this man and yet he's trusting this person because in this kingdom you see when god loves everybody but he does not trust everybody trust is not an impartation there is a track record of faithfulness the bible says moreover it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful is someone learning this is very important so when it comes to fulfilling the desire and the mandate of king jesus please everybody listen the king has an agenda and every responsible citizen who wants to see power wealth influence i did tell you yesterday and let me remind you again that everything that flows from the king to the saints is with respect to his will do not forget this the prosperity that flows from the king to you that's why there is a difference between wealth and kingdom wealth there is a difference between wisdom, Sophia, natural human wisdom, and divine wisdom. Everything that flows from the king to the saints has a mandate to honor his will. With or without God, you can use the law of value and all the laws that you have been taught here, and you can access some level and measure of wealth. But there are certain things you cannot take away, like the sorrow component. But it is the blessing of the Lord, my Bible says, that make it rich and can extract away the sorrow component. Are we together? Everything that flows from the king to you, I remind you again, was supposed to empower you to fulfill his will. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. Even Jesus said, to do thy will, not to do my agenda. Jesus was very vocal as to the fact that his entire journey on earth was to do the will of the father in that similitude that you walk upon the earth and you say i have no agenda of my own that everything i find myself doing is to bring joy and to bring um satisfaction and fulfillment to the king to the father 
even to Jesus. Are we learning this morning? So the Bible calls us ambassadors. The Bible calls us witnesses. There's no time to do this discussion. I have a brief session this morning. But then it's important for you to know that an ambassador does not promote his own agenda. Any ambassador that is caught promoting his own agenda will be punished from the mother nation. Is that true? There's a U.S. ambassador in Nigeria. There are many embassies in Nigeria. And when you get into the U.S. embassy, if you were blindfolded and they opened your eyes, you would not even know you are in Nigeria. Because the entire, the physical space was designed to reflect the mother nation. They do not pay the staff in the U.S. embassy, at least the ones who were brought in, they do not pay them in Naira. Because there's none of their business with the economy of the nation happening there. They are still in touch. Are we together now? Yes. This is very powerful. They are there to promote the interest. They love you, but they are there to promote the interest of the nation that sends them. Are we together? So, you must carry this mentality that I am on earth, I am in Lagos, but I am here as an ambassador. That means everything that concerns Jesus is my business. You don't have to invite me. The moment you mention Jesus and his program, I am automatically invited. So anywhere I see sinners, I am invited. Are we together? Are we learning? Now, let me tell you three things and then I tell you three other things and we're done. The program of God, please write this down. God's kingdom advancement program is threefold. I want you to listen carefully. God's kingdom advancement program is threefold is it alright if I define for you my concept of kingdom advancement will that be fine I define kingdom advancement as every and any scriptural mechanism that is deployed to enthrone Christ and his purposes in the hearts of men and then across every strata of human activities. Let me take it one more time. I define kingdom advancement as any and every scriptural mechanism. Any and every scriptural mechanism deployed. Are we together? To enthrone Christ and his purposes. First in the hearts of men. Then across every strata of human activities. This is what we call kingdom advance. So every time we say kingdom advance, in simple terms, we're talking about the deploying of every scriptural method that ultimately leads to the enthroning of the Christ in the hearts of men, then across the cosmos, across every strata of human activities. Are we together now? And then I'm saying that that kingdom advancement, we call it different names. We call it thy kingdom come. We call it kingdom advancement program. Others even call it God's end time agenda. You are saying one and the same thing. And that it is divided into three. Number one, please write. The first dimension of God's program. If you really want to please God. If you really want to spend your life serving the king. These are the three things that your life should be about. Are you ready? Number one world evangelization please write world evangelization this has nothing to do with whether you are an evangelist or called into the fivefold ministry the great commission was a mandate that was given to everyone by the king himself he did not mandate a prophet so you can't say the prophet slept or forgot or prophesied in part it was jesus himself that commissioned and brought the agenda of the great commission are we together world evangelization what does that mean the harvest in simple terms bringing nations to the obedience of the faith that anyone who finds himself right now participating in any scriptural way to make the world this harvest this agenda of god of world evangelization come to pass i can assure you you have secured the backing of the king number two what is the second dimension of kingdom advancement are you ready the equipping and the maturing of the saints 
the equipping and the maturing of the saints that means that through your contribution you help the church the ecclesia the body of christ to become men and women of stature and knowledge is someone learning whether it is through a book you write whether it's through your giving whether it is by setting up a local assembly, whether it is through your labor and, and love in doctrine, whatever contribution you make that can help believers attain to a point of stature and maturity. God so desires for his church to be matured that even after his finished work, he gave gifts to men. He gave some apostles and prophets. Are we together? And evangelists and pastors and teachers Ephesians chapter 4 says why he says for the equipping the maturing of the saints that the saints now matured will do the work of the ministry to the end that all of us will come into a complete man the fullness of the stature of the measure of Christ the Bible says not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and the slight of men wherein they lie to deceive so God desires that the church because the church is the only instrument he has to birth his purposes and if the axe head be blonde there's going to be a lot of energy that is dissipated are we together look at the vast potential army that King Jesus has on earth but not much is accomplished because most believers are still babes it took 12 men men taught by Jesus himself and they took their world by storm there were 120 in the upper room when the Holy Ghost fell and ladies and gentlemen from 120 people a harvest of 3,000 people came in one night and from 3,000 people they grew until they became a threat to society but what formula did they use Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 I will show you how the church grew the Bible says and they continued steadfastly in the Apostles doctrine are we together and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers take note of these four things the 3,000 that were saved were not just left to go home. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And those ordinary people became mighty men from city to city. Every time persecution came, it only multiplied the effect. And they scattered to cities to the extent that when Paul was in prison, he was not interested in his release. He was interested in a notepad and a pen. Right from prison. He will say, I'm in prison and I've heard that some of you are deviating from what I've spent my time teaching you. Let me assure you I'm coming back. And when I come back, can you imagine? Look at the mentality of such a man. They killed him. He came back to life. Too important to die. Not just claiming I shall not die. He proved it with his life. A man in prison. In prison your prayer should be to come out. Not Paul. Paul was in prison and which church have we not written to? So every time they came to visit him. How are you? He said leave that issue. My desire is the king. And God said what kind of man is this? Hmm. Are we together? So when you talk about the great apostle Paul. It was not just that it was in his destiny to write to third of the New Testament. There is no prophecy in the Bible that prophesies that the man Paul will write to third of the New Testament. It was the degree of his loyalty, his availability. Are we together now? That multiplied that kind of grace. That even the Peter and the other apostles, they, had, they first rejected him. But later on they said, listen, we can't fight this man. We are not stupid people. We, we were mentored by God, but we have seen a level of sacrifice and discernment. They had to extend the right hand of fellowship to him. That means in this conference, there are people who are supposedly ordinary, who came from a family that does not seem to have any pedigree, but by your submission and your loyalty to the king, you will touch something in the spirit that will elevate you in a way that you will become a wonder and a marvel to your world. It is true. This is how men rise. The desire of the king. For me to live is Christ, he says, 
and to die is gain. Can you imagine that? At the zenith of his apostolic ministry, here's what he had to say, that I may know him. Not that I may be great. Not that I may have more things, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Out of the 12 disciples, there was one who survived anything until they did not even know what to do with him. They threw him in the Isle of Patmos. He's called John the Beloved, not John the Anointed, not John the Powerful. When all the other virtues failed, love remained. The one who chose to love, not just to use God, was the one that fire could have no power over. They threw him, according to Bible history, in boiling oil. He refused to burn. So the people just didn't know what to do with him. And do you know what it means to try to kill somebody and it does not die? And they threw him and left him there. That's how he wrote the book of Revelations. Ladies and gentlemen, when you read from scripture the lives of these men and women it was not just that they were uniquely isolated like that not all of them had the election of grace there is a concept of the election of grace but you see there are many people who through availability and the genuineness of their loyalty they have attained onto states and levels in the spirit that men will look at them and be dumbfounded an example of such a person was elisha the next prophet was never supposed to be Elisha after Elijah because ethically the prophet will come from those he was mentoring. He had a school of prophets. So the next prophet should come from there. But he found a man who was loyal. He found a man who was surrendered and he found a man who was obedient. He received a double portion. You can see that even with men, this same principle applies. Are we together? That means the major reason why it looks like God cannot do much with men. I'm telling you, it's not your background. It's not the kind of curses that have surrounded you. It's not true. It's that God is yet to trust your loyalty. God is yet to trust your, your submission, your level of surrenderedness. And God is yet to trust your obedience. I can tell you from scripture and respectfully speaking, I can tell you from experience when God finds a man he can trust you become a wonder to your world you may have heard me say it many times that the Lord told me many years ago and said son if you will let men see me there is nothing I will not give you yes and I believe this with all my heart are we together if you will let men see me now watch this I don't know if I gave this example the last time I was here or any of, of the meeting you may have listened to. I'm not dropping my Bible here. My Bible is here. So the center of attraction is the top of this, this uh, pulpit. Am I right? But is it really true that you can look at the top without looking at what holds it? This is King Jesus. This is you. The goal it's not to be the point of attraction. The point is to focus on him. That the world will see him. But it's impossible. This thing is standing here only because of the efficiency of this. That means if Jesus wants to be lifted higher on earth, it's not only him that will rise. Whoever is holding him and the banner will also rise. Are you seeing how it works? So when your life is committed to bringing glory to the king, he lifts himself by lifting you. It's called the reflection principle. You find that in John 17 and verse 1. Jesus was praying now. The Bible records that he lifted up his eyes to the heavens and he prayed thus. Give us John 17 and verse 1. Here's what he said. Father, the hour is come. He said, glorify thy son that thy son may bring glory to you. Listen again. Glorify thy son. Glorify Joshua Selman. Glorify Calvary Bible Church. Glorify your family. Glorify your lineage. Only that you get glory back. But here's what a lot of us do. Have you watched little children who beg you, they come and say, Mommy, Daddy, and they point their hands. And when you drop maybe something and you say, Give me back. They hold it back. That's what a lot of people do. So we use fasting. We use prayer. We use all kinds of things to say, Lord, I've been waiting. Send this power. And then God will. Anything God gives you initially is not all he intends to give you. 
I can tell you, God never gives you all he intends to give you at once. It is not how the kingdom works. Everything he gives you is a test. As much as that money was when you received it, it is still a test. So 10 million came because you cried and said you were a kingdom financier and he tested you. And he watched you for one month. Nobody knew where you went to. And God kept crying like Adam. My son, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? I don't see you in my presence again. I don't see you in my house. God is calling you. Men are calling you. And then when he's finished, you come back and say, God, I'm here again. He said, no, 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 I'm not here. My love for you has not changed. But we need to do something with this trust thing. This is what is responsible for this balloon success you see. That people rise up and then just come down. Because they do not know that you maintain your stand with the king by remaining ever trustworthy. Ever. He gave one five talent. The Bible is full of the character of God that when you study you can learn God. He gave one five talent. He gave one two talent. He gave one one. That means he has more than 13 or more than eight. If he gave one five, he gave one two, he gave one one. It meant that he had a treasury that was a lot more than that. Then the Bible said he went on a long journey and left them. Then he came back. Look at the character of God. You would think because he has so much, he will not come back. When he fed the people, he said, gather the crumbs. I don't waste. Let them go. But gathered, what would he do with the crumbs when he could multiply it? The one who had five was a faithful steward. He went about doing his business, made five more. The one who had two brought two more. But the guy who had one, you see, he went to bury his talent. You bury seeds, not talents. No, you multiply talents, you refine them. But you went to go and bury the talent and it did not grow because it was not a seed. And when he came back, he called all of them and said, all right, you are stewards, not owners. So give me your stewardship. Oh, I had five. I've gotten five more. He said, you've passed the test. The goal was not talent. I want to give you authority over nations. I taught you yesterday that when God gives you authority over things, it is the least level of spiritual authority that you can command resources, you can command the material world. Believe me, as mighty as that is, that is the least level of authority. When you show faithfulness in that unrighteous mammon, then he will commit to you the true riches of the kingdom. Are we together now? He will grant you access to the hearts of men. When God gives you authority over men and over nations, like Gideon, you will sound a shofar and 33,000 people will come because you have authority. This, see, these rankings in the spirit have physical expressions. You can know who is standing where. And the greatest authority the Bible records that can be trusted to man is authority over God's program. It's like, it's like pastor traveling and he calls you and he says for the next, um, I want something to happen, an empowerment program to happen here and you are in charge. That is a level of trust indeed. Are we together? So, for many of us here, we have not yet come to a point where we realize that the king has a need. And before we start talking of issues of purpose and the rest, my assignment is to bring you to a point where you find out that the creed of the kingdom is your loyalty, your surrenderedness, and your obedience please do not forget this in the name of jesus do not forget this for as long as you live anytime you see god using a man and a woman not just in ministry in any dimension of kingdom exploits at all i want you to know that behind everything you see the glitz the glamour the fame is a man who has fulfilled that condition of surrender of loyalty and of obedience i assure you by god there is no amount of prayer and fasting 
there is no amount of um, religious activity that will replace in fact all of them should work together to lead you to a place of loyalty surrender there are many people who pray there are many people who fast but the, the level of rebellion against the king that's why you find out that people sometimes they submit they can even read their bible sincerely they can go and lock themselves somewhere and respectfully speaking at the end of it they return back with familiar spirits because before your activity is accepted your heart condition is the greatest thing god looks at god is not carried away by your tears he's touched but moved by the sincerity of your heart this heart condition vetoes your bible study it vetoes your prayer it vetoes your coming to church if your heart is not right you have no business with the king in this kingdom no wonder the psalmist will say try my heart is that true try my heart test my thoughts and says if you see in me any way that is wicked purge me and bring me to the way everlasting king jesus now let me just tie this and then we'll find somewhere to pray to be an effective ambassador or to be an effective witness there are three stages you must pass through. Please write this down. This is now proper discipleship. To be an effective ambassador, God is preparing you now to release you to your world. To be an effective ambassador, an effective witness, there are three levels that you must pass through, non-negotiable. Number one, transformation. This is the first level of dealings that you must go through. Seasons of intense transformation. When you want to know the power of transformation, you have to study insects. An insect transits, as we know, from egg, larva, am I right on that? Pupa and then adult. It's the same insect, but the insect cannot, what the egg can do, the larva cannot do. What the lava can do, the pupa cannot do. It is the full-grown adult insect that can fly and do a lot of things. That means within the same insect are possibilities, but he has to change states to be able to manifest them. Within the same you is the ability to take the healing anointing. Within the same you is the ability to be a billionaire. Within the same you is the ability to be a leader over nations in politics and governance, but not this version of you. So when God comes to you and says, follow me, that begins the process of transformation. Are we together now? The king demands that you come as you are, but you are not used as you are. You come as you are, but you are made. He's a maker. Please listen. There are many people praying prayers that cannot be answered at the level they are. It becomes a risk to the body of Christ if the prayer you are crying for is being answered. Lord, I pray that you give me one billion. And God says, I can give. I am a giver. It is, it is the signature of fatherhood to give. But this level of you, <clears throat> with the flesh that is alive, with the fleshly encumbrances is going to be very difficult you cannot be trusted you see most believers do not understand that transformation qualifies you to manifest deeper things in the spirit transformation qualifies you to manifest deeper things in the spirit it is not as though god does not want to use many people it is not as though god does not want to lift people like pastor said earlier on there are no grandsons of god we are all sons in the kingdom but you see our possibilities depend on our extent of transformation so the bible says it this way romans chapter 12 and verse 1 it says i beseech you therefore by the mercies of god that ye offer your bodies present your bodies unto god a living sacrifice he says holy and acceptable unto god he calls it your reasonable act of worship let's go to verse 2 verse 2 says 
and be not conformed to this world is the Greek word aeon, the thinking pattern that comes with the system. That means there is a way that the world thinks. There is a way that the, the cosmos that is under the influence of the Antichrist spirit. I hope you know that the Antichrist spirit is what powers the Antichrist system. And that the Antichrist system has a way that they think. And it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that you will be able to prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He did not just excel because he was the son of God. He excelled because there was a mentality. This is the value of mentorship. The value of doctrine. The value of discipleship. That you begin to receive a new orientation that is consistent with the word of God. Now, we come from different cultures. We come from different societies. We come from different exposure levels, different sociological contexts. But when we come to the kingdom, watch this. This is why God sends a teaching priest like your man of God. What is his assignment? To begin to help you, to bring you methodically to a place of understanding, to give you a kingdom mentality. Do not forget this. It takes a kingdom mentality to command kingdom exploits. It takes more than a sincere desire. A kingdom mentality. Daniel 11 and verse 32 B. But the people that do know their God, the Bible records, it says they shall be strong and they shall do exploits. You know what that means? Please look up. There are three levels here. It says number one, knowledge. The people that do know, it starts with knowledge. Then the second level is transformation. They shall be. Then exploits they shall do. So knowledge, transformation, and exploits. Is someone learning? The first level you must pass through is the level of transformation. And it takes a long time to be transformed. Because there are many age-old ideas about God, about life, about Satan, about wealth, about poverty. You see that the process of transformation is not something that happens in a weekend. It takes a long time. God has to now give you a new orientation. My question for you this morning, please look up. What do you believe about God? What do you believe about Satan? What do you believe about poverty? What do you believe about wealth? What do you believe about failure? What do you believe about success? What do you believe about death? What do you believe about life? What do you believe about yourself? What do you believe about your destiny? The answer to all this is captured in mentorship and discipleship. It is the assignment of the teaching priest to now begin to unveil the new you in light of scripture. Are we together? So that when you have spent two, three, four, five years in church, it's not just the names of church members you should know alone. You should understand the ways of God. The modus operandi of the kingdom with the precision of an expert to the point that when you see someone, you can simply diagnose the person's situation using the reference of the knowledge you have gotten in scripture. So, if someone comes to you and says, look, nothing is working in my life. I mean, completely no favor, no open doors. As a believer who has been properly mentored, you should know how to attend to that person. And it's not just, let's pray. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Based on what you were taught, diagnose this situation even as i'm saying it now use your mind to diagnose the situation what would if someone comes to you now and says i cannot sleep there are all kinds of spirits oppressing me i wake up in the morning more tired than i was before i slept what will you do don't answer just think so that even if you are wrong at least you don't feel bad emoji what is going to be the scriptural so remember you are born and you want to go to the nations now here is a specimen what are you going to do you will be surprised how that many believers the only thing they know is okay let's pray father you see this situation help the person in jesus name that's a very sincere approach 
but the Paul says he that strives for mastery is not crowned unless he strives lawfully you can attain to a point of mastery the same way when you come to meet a consultant while you are shouting and say sir i had a pain and then joint pains he's just smiling at you and sometimes he may not give you the kind of attention you want you can even be angry i'm talking to you about my he says i already know what is wrong with you and he's not lying he will write a prescription and say return back rejoicing after five days Day two, you will call him and say, nothing has changed. He said, just keep doing what I asked you to do. By day five, you are running around and saying, thank you, sir. He said, that's why I'm a consultant. Respect the years of sacrifice. Is someone learning? But many believers are not able to provide solutions because we are not transformed. We are not transformed. We have not submitted ourselves to transformation. In one minute, let me request that you lay your hands on your head and cry to the Lord God of heaven. Father, I contend for transformation beginning from this conference in the name of Jesus. Is someone praying? Lay your hands on your head and decree and declare that every thought line, every thought process that is inconsistent with the values of the kingdom, inconsistent with the will of the king, that it will live your life now and live your life forever wrong cultural ideas wrong sociological ideas ideas that came from sincere people who may not be godly i like you to pray if you truly want to be used by the king to fulfill the agenda of the kingdom there has to be a season of transformation pray one minute In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Please look up. Now, respectfully speaking, transformation that I talk about is not just technological advancement. I think I need to tell you what my idea of transformation is your change which is consistent to the character of Christ. So, you can travel and go overseas and return with another idea which is still an Egyptian idea. You are not transformed. You were only enlightened as far as secular enlightenment is concerned because when we talk of transformation i'm not just talking of moving from a typewriter to a phone i'm not talking of just from typing to swiping no that is important but i'm talking about the character of the kingdom the modus operandi of the kingdom now being embedded in your mind are we together so that your first response to life and its challenges is is as prescribed by scripture this is what we call transformation. So many people are becoming Western, but not becoming kingdom-minded or scriptural. You can take someone from a village and respectfully speaking, take someone from America, Europe, put them together. From a technological standpoint, they will be East and West apart. But from a cosmos standpoint, they're all in the same place because they will be tested with respect to scripture. Are we together? The second level, very quickly, so that we wrap up, is empowerment. I told you that becoming an ambassador or becoming a witness that serves the purposes of the kingdom demands that you pass through this phase of number one, transformation. Number two, empowerment. Why is empowerment necessary? We'll talk more, of that, more on that in the evening. You cannot fulfill, you cannot achieve the agenda of the king in the strength of the flesh. The strength of the flesh cannot achieve the purposes of the kingdom. No. You are contending against forces of darkness that are determined to ward off the program of God. Jesus himself said, I will build my church. Is that in your Bible? And he says, the gates of hell. So the gates of hell were recognized and acknowledged by Jesus. They are still at work, functional. If God lifts you now and you are the person who will rewrite the narrative of your story, of the, your family, I assure you that Satan is not going to fold his arms and watch you. You need empowerment. Empowerment. Say unto God, Psalm 66 and verse 3, How terrible art thou in your ways? It says, Through the greatness of thy power shall thy enemies submit themselves. The disciples were already transformed, but Jesus told them, tarry. You already have what to say. You know what to say, but you are not aware of the contentions that will be coming against you. Listen, 
believers especially if you are called into the fivefold ministry here i submit to you that by all means no matter how enlightened you are seek genuine empowerment before you become a casualty to yourself and to the body of christ you have no idea of the activities of darkness that happen daily to bring down anybody who names the name of christ it takes power to remain if you are called to be a kingdom financier, it takes intelligence, value, relationships to have resources. But the Bible says strong men retain wealth. It takes strength to retain lasting wealth. Are we together? Yes. Most people lack strength that if you turn aside in the day of battle, the spiritual diagnosis is that your strength is small. empowerment it's a secret that i learned early in ministry and it's an aspect of my life in being a witness and an ambassador that i do not joke with because i realize that to birth the purposes of god with respect to the assignment is committed to my hands is power dependent power dependent mommy it takes power more than compassion to raise children that the devil will not hijack it takes power to take care of five children plus you know how it is in africa 15 others that are connected to you they don't know you but as you rise they will find you they will say i look related to you and they will investigate and say i'm truly related to you <laughs> are we together nobody takes care of himself alone in africa you are joking you just don't know the story but keep rising you get to a point where everybody starts coming to greet you and say we answer the same surname there has to be a connection say power. power one more time say power. power you ask the man of god he will tell you it's taking power to get to this this point and this phase in your life and even in ministry it's taking power to move and the value that god has given him to serve the body of christ is not just intelligence he will tell you some of the challenges that the devil will want to bring there's someone here you're a businessman there's someone here you're a man of god and you think all it takes to excel is sincerity i'm introducing a power component for you this world lies in wickedness it is it is a fact that the, someone can get up and say why are you the one rising why are you the one doing well what what if you find yourself in a corporation where you are the only kingdom person not just the only christian but the only one god can depend upon it takes power it takes power genuine power you need empowerment and i believe that in the course of this conference before it is over in the name of jesus power from on high will rest upon someone and you will see that that is the missing factor in your business your store already have all the products but no power so you find out that you are deficient in many ways you're a man of God, it takes power to command results. Results that will compel the nations to bring glory to the name of the Lord. Beyond the excellency of speech, there must be a demonstration of power. That the faith of the people will not rest upon the wisdom of men, but upon the power of God. Are we blessed? It takes power to be rich. No wonder the Bible says, Thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. Deuteronomy 8, 18. For it is he that giveth thee the power to get wealth. Why would God mention power and wealth? You should talk of power and sickness or power and the miraculous. And he uses power for wealth. The power to get wealth. For the Bible says, except the Lord builds the house. Are we learning? I'm wrapping up. Except the Lord builds a house, the Bible says they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord watches over the city, he said the watchmen watch it but in vain. Please listen to me. He says it is vain to wake up early in the morning and to sleep late at night only to eat the bread of sorrow. He says, but he giveth his beloved sleep. So if you find yourself struggling in your Christian experience, struggling to command results, and do you know 
you know that you need empowerment when you have knowledge but the grace to defend what you know is not there so you keep saying a lot of things that are correct but cannot be proven you have enlightenment but no power for instance Jesus can heal Jesus can deliver Jesus can restore you are right now the sick come but the power to make your speakings come to pass is not there you see and it's dangerous to speak without the power to demonstrate because in the kingdom believers must hear and see if you say the Lord is good they must see that the Lord is good if you say the Lord prospers this is why people are tired of church because they have been hearing and not seeing Acts chapter 8 from verse 5 the Bible says and Philip preached Christ in Samaria and the Bible says verse 6 that the people gave heed with one accord hearing and seeing hearing and seeing it's not just to indefinitely keep hoping that the Lord is good you can taste and see that the Lord is good that you can say I came to this church I was down on my rent my children and as i kept hearing the man of god teach and releasing that grace look what my life has become now do you know let me tell you the truth a personal witness with results is powerful when they healed the man at get beautiful when the jerusalem council summoned peter he went with the man who was healed to stand close to him and they said we don't have any charge there's nothing we can tell this man for many of us, the reason why our territories cannot submit to the governing influence of the king is because they respect the truthfulness of our speakings, but the power component is missing. And unfortunately, our idea, power is so missing in the body of Christ that we have reduced our idea to power to just falling down. So the moment someone falls down, at least it's justified that I'm anointed. Doesn't matter what you think about me again, at least... <laughs> not being sarcastic but it's really funny and laughable are you kidding so when something hits you and you fall down does is that power you know what power is the ability to veto the current realities of men and rewrite their destinies to be consistent with the will of god that is power that you can look at a man who came to church now and that person by evening he will be locked up and you stand and in the name of Jesus you create a climate of favor that in two hours what that man has not gotten in one year comes to him that is power genuine power look what Jesus did ten lepers and he says stand up go and show yourself to the priest the Bible says as they went a miracle began to happen there was embarrassment that was imminent in a feast are we together now and he said don't worry I'm here I can solve that embarrassment once and for all and then fill six pots he said go and serve the rulers that was the end of it one time he went to Peter's house and the mother-in-law who should help them was sick another embarrassment again and he went and held her hands and lifted her listen ladies and gentlemen if you are a businessman the day you carry power you can place that contract on the ground and lay your hands you have been sending an empty paper with ink on it that's why people are rejecting you the day you add power i know what i'm saying don't you think i'm just doing pentecostal talk no the power of the holy ghost is a very missing component in the body of christ is the reason why we keep talking about so many things you see now many people are getting to a point where they are saying listen we are tired of church and the herbalist is saying i am an alternative social media is saying i am an alternative all kinds of religions are saying we are alternatives we can't tell believers to stop going to herbalists and stop going to shrines until we we offer an alternative that works Are we together some of us here have loved ones who are trusting God for healing some of us have been grounded by all kinds of demonic forces
And it is so painful to see a Christian who loves Jesus with all their heart. And, and their love for Jesus is known to all, but they never move forward. That is a bad description of Jesus. And the devil likes such people. So when he finds a sister who is faithful in church, a brother who is serving, they tie down that destiny so that it becomes a portrait that misrepresents God. That is the assignment of power. The assignment of power is to rewrite that narrative. That the brother you were laughing at and saying, look at these church people. He rejected bribe in his office. You would have been a billionaire right now by just signing your signature. But in the name of some Christian thing, you said you will not compromise. And then the God of heaven comes and lifts you. Do you know what it means when God's people are lifted? It is a very strong message that even encourages other believers. Am I right on that? Let me two more minutes. I'm going to request that you lay your hands one more time and say, Lord, where my life has been bankrupt of power, in this season I insist and in this conference I pray the power components that is required to represent your purposes, not just in ministry and not just talking of power to heal the sick, power to go forward, power to go forward in spite of the economy, power to make progress in spite of the wickedness of men power to make advancement in spite of tribal sentiment open your mouth and pray pray on behalf of your children pray on behalf of your spouse someone pray the power to prosper the power for signs and wonders the power to raise the power that brings influence commanding genuine consistent ever increasing kingdom results for the sake of his majesty and for the glory of the king Hallelujah. Keep praying. You have won the victory. If that is true, it must show in your life. Hallelujah. You have won it all for me. Death could not hold you down. You are the reason king. You're seated in majesty. Listen, please look at me. Please look at me. I'm wrapping up, but my spirit is so fired up. Just listen to me. Sir, do you know, with all humility, I have prayed for people who have brought charms, and brought all kinds of demonic things and said apostle i'm tired of this and sometimes i ask them why did you get this and they say in my sincere desire to rise tired or it's not like i'm an evil person but someone called me and said listen if it is finances you want it's not going to work by all this grammar you better come and receive something and some of those people and honestly some of them would tell me that when they received it for a while it was like something just happened and they started soaring before it backfired there are dimensions in the spiritual where the power of god is introduced to your life and it turns you into a wonder a wonder what is there about building a house that everybody is almost becoming a thing of mockery i'm not being stupid god knows that with your background by the time you contend for transformation, if the only thing you have is transformation, you will talk a lot of good things in your life till people begin to mock you. What are the 12 steps to an exceptional financial life? Oh, I've learned from Dr. Lumide Emanuel. All of you sit down and you give an intelligent lecture. 
Are you seeing that? And at the end of the lecture, I'm not mocking you. Everybody comes out and you are still trekking. You are the one who spoke smartest transformation, but no empowerment. There are many people like that. When it has to do with the educational dimension of transformation, don't come near them. They will speak and what they are saying is not a lie, but the grace to make it happen. There is something called the power of performance. It says, blessed is she that believeth, for unto her there shall be a performance. People teach on favor, series on favor, but you do not see it in their lives at all. He said, that which we have seen, that which we have heard, that which our hands have handled. Listen, I'm taking out time this morning because I sense God is speaking to someone that if all you do is to keep talking, your family members may die in your presence and you will keep watching them and you are saying, Jesus saves. They are getting sick. Jesus saves. Their health is deteriorating. Oh, Jesus heals. They are still getting sick. It is the absence of power. Let me tell you, when genuine power comes there, you will lift them up and say, Jesus heals. They will prosper then you say jesus lives the gospel was never supposed to be communicated bankrupt of power i am not ashamed of the gospel of christ he says for it is the power not just the discussion the power you may be a man of god here this may be why your ministry is grounded restore the power component you are speaking the truth you are not with God you are a sincere person but for God's sake don't just say what God can do prove what God can do with your life this is a generation of evidence someone pray one minute Lord bring evidence to my life evidence to my Christian experience Bring evidence to oh no, my life, life with such a testimony a life that a brings glory minutes. to the name of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord. The results Bring are not for pride. Life, the results are not Let for self-aggrandizement. In the name of Jesus, Makapo Zokasata. In Jesus' name. Amen. Watch this. Do you know how many times Jesus kept saying he would die and come back to life? Was he lying? But when he was in that grave, everybody kept quiet. They forgot everything he said and everything he said did not matter until the third day. If Jesus did not come back to life, even you will reject everything he said. With all the I love you Jesus you are saying today, you only love him because his resurrection gave you the boldness to say he's not a liar. Am I right on that? Imagine if Jesus was still in the grave and he said, don't worry, I'm still working on it. After 2,000 years, you just believe and then if some prophet comes and says, look, I spoke with the spirit of Jesus. He said he's in hell. He's almost there. Just for the door to open. The door has not really opened very well. Will you serve such a God? Let's be honest. It is not difficult to take the gospel. It is the proof to demonstrate it our fathers many of them who have joined the cloud of witnesses today men like Maurice Sorulo men like T.L. Osborne they went to nations and they brought a message as at the time they were preaching everybody was watching them like this others were even waiting for them to finish so they killed them but when the power component came let power come upon your business and you watch what your life becomes let power come upon your family let power come upon your goals and your plans somebody shout send power lord one more time say send power lord say for the last time send power lord please open your mouth and pray send power to my life power to my destiny power to my ministry power to my finances in the name of jesus Lord, send down your power, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we cry for your power. We cry for your torture. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, send down your power. In the name of Let me Jesus. give you the last key. 
apologize for stretching us number one transformation to be an ambassador number two empowerment the third i'll just mention it may not have time to discuss the third is purpose purpose as much as we have shouted power now power is only useful when it is within the jurisdiction of purpose purpose is now where god begins to unveil to you the role that you have to play as an ambassador carrying power and running away with it is like a high tension wire that is not coordinated you are going to kill people are we together now the beauty of power is that it is channeled accordingly it powers your fridge are we together imagine if there are all kinds of wires in your house all carrying light and then they are all dangling from your parlor to your kitchen by mistake one will touch your head and shock you by mistake one will touch your hand and shock you if you want to charge your phone you look for two wires and draw. is that a good way to no it is that that power is well coordinated they move it through walls they channel it properly so that you get to a point where by the time you plug your recharge or you switch on your tv or your fridge you see everything working in your house it is not just power that brought it it is power that was directed to purpose imagine someone who kicks a car and fires on 180 and just rests his head that is power manifesting as speed but not channeled towards a direction so let me tell you because this is now the carelessness of my generation of ministers we have contended through fasting prayer and doctrine for power but we have not managed ourselves with purpose so there is a lot of excess you know misbehaviors and all kinds of things people do with power especially the prophetic and the apostolic ministry respectfully speaking all of this mismanagement is because there is so much power locked up but there is no purpose when you contend for power and you do not have purpose it's, it's almost as if you will explode so there are many things they will call you to come and raise offering you will talk for one hour and prophesy and preach and say this and say look i know it's just offering but just allow me and the people are saying what kind of indiscipline is this is because until you find purpose purpose is what gives value to empowerment so all this power you have given me lord to what end and he says i have given you the power to prosper now you have 10 billion coming per annum that is too much money for your personal life i'm telling you you will think that is small but use 10 billion for yourself again and again you will see that there is a kind of problem only that kind of money brings to your life you will solve the problem of lack and want but the problem of wickedness and thieves and distrust so the 10 billion is coming because god expects that you will know the purpose that no crusade should happen around you without your seed going you see so the more you are channeling that money to purpose you will see that as it is coming it's not killing you that's why a river flows unhindered but by the time you put a blockade the water starts building and it will now flood somewhere and even destroy the home many believers in church and i say this respectfully speaking to even servants of god while we are training young people in church let's create channels for that river to flow if not when somebody who say for instance is in a youth class and you are teaching the person and the person becomes so anointed so powerful and the only thing he's doing is cleaning chairs there will be trouble in that church because that level of power is too much for that assignment you see what causes a lot of trouble and the guy is boiling and there's fire rushing in his bones he does not know what to do the next thing you go to one member's house and say listen i can i do a bible study with you it's not it's not just rebellion it is that power must be channeled to purpose are we learning now <laughs> i have to stop here let's pray <laughs> father we thank you for this morning this afternoon we bless you for helping us and showing us mercy in the name of jesus i decree and declare standing on the grace of the man of god and i pray that god who has shown us mercy now in the name of jesus will continue to show us mercy Amen. we will experience tremendous transformation Amen. as we submit ourselves to learning submit ourselves to doctrine 
in the name of Jesus, I declare that there will be empowerment upon our lives Amen. to defend everything we claim the king is able to do. Yeah. And finally, I declare that God will reveal to us with precision the purposes that are connected to the power that he releases upon us. In the name of Jesus, may the Lord bless you. Amen. May the Lord increase Amen. you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Let's welcome Apostle back. Um, let me look at the time. Okay, so let's reduce it to 40 minutes. Okay, so let's do 40 minutes max. That's good. Please, have your seat. Okay. Ah, uh, So many questions. Thank you, Apostle, for being a blessing. Once Thank again. you. Thank you so much, sir. So, um, let's see some questions. Okay. I think I've seen two of these, so let me just start with that. Okay. Two people are asking the same question. You said um, to Apostle Selma, God's advancement program is threefold. World evangelism, equipping and maturing the saints that you did not give us number three. So, the second person say, Apostle, the third aspect of God's kingdom advancement program was skipped. So that means they are following. So what's number three? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. My apologies. Um, the first, like I said, is world evangelization. Second is the maturing of the saints. The third is societal transformation. Okay. Please write. The third is societal transformation. Where the transformed individual who now together with the body of Christ is now transformed can now change and transform society. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next one here says, Apostle Joshua, when you have diverse of purpose, ah, okay, how do, okay, how do you go about it, sir? I don't know. Well, maybe you diverse of purpose. I, <laughs> I think I understand what the person is trying to say. Um, it is... Well, it depends on your idea of purpose because purpose should not be confused with talents. Talents are the instruments that help you and giftings to fulfill purpose. When you enter a house, there is always a master door. There may be other doors in the house, but you access through a master door. So the most important thing, I define purpose as the role that you have to play in the big picture of God's program. Right? So... Um, you must, this is why mentorship is very powerful because it helps you to be able to weave your ambition, your creativity and everything into a single assignment. I was, I was sitting there and watching beautifully as you were showing the different arms of expression in this ministry. Now the ministry has a central theme, is that true, that, that, that summarizes all that God has mandated Dr. Lumide to achieve, but you see that there were very many arms of expression um, captured in all the programs that you hold. So for that person, I will advise, number one, that you seek guidance to enlighten you so that we bring together all your area of giftings um, and then you must be able to use them to serve a very particular point. I'm sure you were taught about the seven mountains and, and you're familiar with them. The seven mountains represent the spheres of influence that controls the mind uh, and, and controls activities in our world. And so what you call your assignment is simply the role you have to play in one or more of these seven mountains. Um, for further study, let me refer you to a number of books that your man of God may have written as touching purpose. Are we together? Or you go to the bookstore and get Dr. Miles Monroe's book, God's Big Idea. That will help you to unlock uh, the subject of purpose. Thank you. Okay. Um, I want to try and focus more on the questions they are asking you. I'll, I'll probably take my own tomorrow if there's, um, so that we can take yours. So this one says, okay, this is mine. Okay. If someone, if someone always sees himself sitting under a particular man of God's teaching, conference, and the man of God also praying for him in a dream, and the same persons do see himself in a dream casting out demons 
and yet is not experiencing this in the physical. What could this signify? <laughs> you are the interpreter of dream now. <laughs> A very sincere question. Well, it's not unusual to see. Now, remember that God, his, his, his method has always been men as far as reaching people. So it's not unusual to have dreams and visionary encounters where you see maybe a man of God you respect and honor, praying for you, ministering to you. God is simply revealing to you that there is a dimension of himself that he committed to that man of God that may be necessary for your overall profiting. It doesn't necessarily mean to leave your church and go to that man of God, not necessarily. You see, because that would produce a lot of rebellion, it's important to be planted where God has kept you. However, um, with proper pastoral guidance and counsel, you can explore, God can help you to explore the particular materials from that man of God that may add up for your profiting. It's like a student who is studying in the university. There are courses that are called electives, is that true? And sometimes you may need to go to another faculty entirely to outsource one or two courses, but that does not deviate you from what you are studying. Are we together? So that you are having dreams, praying for someone, and um, waking up and it not happening, that is a natural thing. It is stimulating you to know that that can be a realm of reality if you walk in keeping with certain conditions. Joseph had a dream. He saw himself exalted, but that was not the case. So he needed to go through all of the dealings that will ultimately lead him there. The good news is that at the end, he got there. So for whoever submitted that question, my charge for you would be to submit yourself to prayers, mentorship, the word, you know, fellowship, and you'll find out that you begin to grow and evolve to the person who can manifest the things that you've seen in your dream. I hope that helps. God okay. bless you. Um, how do I get healing on my eyes? For the more I pray, the more it gets worse. And I've been to a lot of hospitals, and many people have prayed for me. What can be responsible for this delay in my healing? Thank you. The healing ministry generally depends on the hearing of faith. Every time the Bible talks about the healing ministry of Jesus, as we learn, it always goes hand in glove with hearing. So um, sometimes, as much as believers have access to God, for the reasons that I have taught here, you may not yet have access that level of grace and experience to administer that healing for yourself. And so, conferences like this give the Holy Spirit an allowance to use vessels he has anointed to also reach out to you on that wise. So for whoever that person is, come tonight with your heart open, expecting that the power of God will touch you. But know this for certainty, that the healing ministry is still valid, and Jesus is still in the business of healing. Amen. God bless you. Uh, my question goes to Apostle Selman. How can I really surrender? We spoke about what does it really entail? Um, okay. Surrender broadly is, uh, um, has to do with what, number one, dying to self. That means you get to a point where Jesus Christ and his purposes become your highest obsession, your highest priority. And nobody can truly surrender by himself. You just give God the chance and the allowance to dethrone every other thing that is not God in your life. Are we together now? So surrender is a cumulative of many phases and many processes of dealings with God where you become alive to righteousness and dead to yourself. The impulses of this world, materialism and all the things that seem to distract the believer. So it's not just a one-off thing that happens. Um, surrender is an ongoing process. Paul says it this way. He says that I die daily. So that is the process of surrender. But the, ultimately, the goal of surrender is to get you to that point where Christ and his purposes are enthroned at the epicenter of your heart. That does not mean you will not focus on any other thing, but that when it has to do with Christ and his purposes, nothing else is exalted above it. So that is God's idea of surrender. Hallelujah. Okay, there are many questions around this same theme, but I think it's been, if you listen to the message, many times you need to understand that um, you need to listen to a message over and yes. over again until the word becomes flesh. Because most of the time, the questions you are asking are things that has already been dealt with. Uh, so many of them are around... Um, 
I am always weak in the spirit. How do I stay strong in the spirit? How do I maintain power for my spiritual growth? These are the things that have been taught. So, but generally, the theme is around how do I keep that fire going oh, as a believer? Okay, so yeah. that, that's a very good question. I think most believers do not know how to sustain their spiritual fire. Spiritual growth and spiritual maturity have a very definite pathway that leads there. Number one is the ministry of the word. Two scriptures I will give you. You may want to write them down. Number one, um, Acts chapter 2 from verse 42 to 47, where we read earlier that they, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in breaking of bread, fellowship, and prayer. And then the second is Acts chapter 6 and verse 4. It says, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So essentially, believers grow and mature uh, to the extent to which they encounter the word of God and they submit themselves to the ministry of prayer. But then corporate fellowship like this where believers can be mentored is a very uh, powerful platform to be able to grow the believer. You must, um, well, um, let, me, let me ask for permission, and if your pastor allows, let me please recommend a teaching for you that you want to listen, Equipping the Saints. Equipping the Saints. You can find that on YouTube at the permission of your pastor. I say that because I teach there on the training pathway of the believer. For instance, I say how that your prayer life is not going to be rich until it is systematized. Randomly praying does not lead you to progress. You have to create a system around your prayer life. And then your encounter with the word. There are three things we do with the word in order to be matured by it. Number one, we study the word. Number two, we hear the word because faith comes by hearing. And then number three, we speak the word. So when it has to do with the ministry of the word, we study, your mind is involved, your hearing is involved, your speaking is involved. And then, of course, corporate fellowship. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. For, for the person seeking maturity, do not downplay prayer, do not downplay the study of the word. Uh, the word there extends to materials. I saw that there's a book stand, and if I'm right, I see that there's a book stand there too. So do well to access the relevant materials. And let me recommend for you, if you are starting, the best way I recommend for a believer who is starting is topical study of the scripture. Topical study. That means you pick topic by topic. If it's on faith, if it's on righteousness, uh, you may not yet have the stamina to start reading 15 chapters a day or explore from a theological standpoint. So it's wise and simple. This is where devotionals also help because they give a topical approach to the study of scripture. I hope that helps. God bless you. Okay. Um, this person seemed to want to know more about you. This is, these are personal questions, but um, they will help people. Number one, who is your spiritual father? Then the second person is also asking, God has been using you mightily and we know you are not married. So how do you deal with temptation of women to be able to stand as a man of God? Okay, praise the Lord. Uh, well, no, no, let's, let's be fair and honest to whoever that person is. The temptation, let me start with the second. The temptation over women and the rest has nothing to do with being married or not. It's only a lot more aggressive when you're not. The same disciplines hold true for anybody. Mm -hmm. when, because when it has to do with the matters of the flesh, it has no respect whether you have a wife, whether you have children, whether you are young or old. You see, that is the truth. Uh, I think the key, the key, aside from your personal conviction dying to self, the key is to create systems around your life. Um, when you do not create systems around your life, inevitably, married or not, you will fall victim. So number one, it starts with your fellowship. Every anointing has a consecration level that protects and preserves it. Hallelujah. And then secondly, it's important to create. This is why periodic retreats are very important because they give you an opportunity to go before the Lord and to cry out to be 
dealt with and to be built by God. Are we together now? And that is very, very important. Now to the first question. It's created a lot of controversy, unfortunately, in the body of Christ. Uh, well, if you are dealing with the issue of fatherhood and submission, um, most people ask these questions because they come from Pentecostal circles. When you meet people who come from Orthodox background, especially people who come from the North, this question uh, has an angle to it. The concept of mentorship and fatherhood to people who were raised by the North is rather systemic than individual. Because the way ministries are in the North, they do not have a single overseer that everybody who comes under submits to. Now, that does not mean it is wrong. Are we together now? I've heard all kinds of teachings about that. And um, we came from a background where whoever was your pastor, after three years, you will not see the person again. You get the point now. At various phases of my life and my experience, I've had different people being introduced. I was raised from Equa. My grandfather, by the way, was the founding father and the trustee of the Church of Christ in Nation. So I came from that, that lineage and then my experience with the evangelical church winning all and then seasons of mentorship and training under Archbishop Benjamin Kwashi, the Anglican Seminary, you see that. But then I think the unique nature of my life mandated and necessitated that I kept having a lot of experiences with different people, uh, I would, I would not frown at the concept of having a single father, an individual who you lead. I submit to the body of Christ. I'm very clear about that. You've seen my relationship with fathers. Um, and I've gone to the Lord in prayer, uh, asking questions on that. And God has planted me across several people, a father in the Lord, uh, Baba Deboye, Bishop Oedipo, and several people. These are people who represent authority structure. So my concept of fatherhood uh, is a bit different from what is generally understood in the body of Christ. And I don't want to delve so much so that it does not become a template that brings confusion nor plants rebellion to people who are submitting to fathers. That's why I'm careful addressing this. But the concept of fatherhood as we know in church uh, it's not all that there is to fatherhood, unfortunately. For various reasons, um, I may not want to delve into certain things here because I, this is not exclusively a pastor's conference, else there are things we would have been able to share. But here is my, my, um, my take for whoever is asking that question. If God has planted you in a ministry like this, the man of God, the overseer that he has set over you, becomes your father from the word Abba, the one who begat you in the gospel. That is the original idea of fatherhood, the one who begat you in the gospel. But you see that that template is not really ideal because many people who come are usually already saved and even already transformed. For most of them, there may be men and women who are in ministry who just come to submit to get direction. So what most people call fatherhood is actually mentorship. Fatherhood classically starts from the point of getting you saved and then growing you spiritually. That means there is a track record of having, making, have, having made that spiritual investment in your life. You get the idea now? So there, there are dimensions of fatherhood, unfortunately, that have been abused in Africa. For many people, it's just a license to show that you are not a rebel. And so people just look for anybody and just continue with a lot of rebellion with no touch at all with the father. The purpose of fatherhood is supposed to be for guidance, for mentorship, for correction. There are other people who have even deviated from the way of the Lord because of honor to fatherhood. Um, this is why I don't want to get into certain details because you will find out that when fatherhood is not correct, you can literally lose the context of your call. If the father is insecure as a person, he will have to force you to be loyal to the template he has given you, which may be against what God told you, which is the security that Eli had to allow Samuel to evolve. If he had followed the Eli pattern, something will go wrong. So uh, fatherhood issue is very, very complicated, but I will leave you with this word. The man you see is not a rebel. This man you see, I am more submissive than most people that you see. There are results you cannot attain unto 
except when certain spiritual laws are in place. Are we together? So I hope I was able to help whoever that person is. Okay. So I think um, maybe this will also help with the issue you have just mentioned. Yes. Now. Many thanks for your powerful and insightful teaching you taught during your session. I could recall, um, now this question is for both of us, okay. but I want to give it to you because of what you have just said now. <laughs> then I will also answer my part later because I want okay. us to focus more on you. So the person in the first paragraph is referring to my session. Um, I could recall that you said in your session that it is a joy for every spiritual father to see his or her sons thriving and succeeding more yes. than them, mm. which is what I said in my session. So the person now went to this question that now affects two of us. Now, I would like to get clarity from both of you. So he has now oh. left me to talk. <laughs> so having served my spiritual father closely for 16 years, faithfully and sincerely, with all I have got, a time came that God now beckoned at me to go and start my ministry and with a lot of confirmations, vetting the authenticity of this timely message of living. My spiritual father is not willing to let me go and has been using every means, crooked and unbiblical, to tie me down. There has been a track record of people leaving the ministry out of anger and frustration. I do not want to be like those people. I want to wait until I'm released. So what do I do? Do I obey God or hearken to the spiritual father? Hmm. Praise the Lord. This, this is a very, please listen, let's listen. This is a very sincere person. Now, um, you, you don't say driving is bad because there are so many accidents on the road. So, my attempt to answer this question is by no means downplaying the role of fatherhood. But I want to submit to you, and I've had the honor of discussing this uh, privately with some of our fathers of faith in this nation. I have expressed my personal concern as to what we call fatherhood in Africa. I submit to you that um, a lot of what we call fatherhood in Africa is not scriptural fatherhood. It's just a lot of eventing of insecurities from people. Now because, um, and please take note of my disclaimer, don't go around insulting fathers. I have frowned at that and discouraged it at the highest level, but just to honor this question truthfully. So many people, so many people have missed out on their purpose and their assignment because of the idea of fatherhood. The idea of fatherhood in Africa is almost slavery. It's as though you are connected to someone and your life and relevance only holds provided you are with the person. There is no sense if you are ever found walking in any pattern that God told you that is outside of the frame of understanding of the father, you are going to get into trouble. And then the father's battle also becomes your battle if there are friends, and, you know, all kinds of things. I don't want to go into that. But for this person, um, I will not encourage rebellion at any level. I rather will encourage you to seek counsel from somebody who is a contemporary at the level of your father. Don't seek counsel from someone who is your contemporary. They will not be able to help because the Bible says to not rebuke an elder. In public are we together so if I were that person the first thing I'm going to do is to continue to pray as I serve that to the last second in that ministry you leave a track record of loyalty and faithfulness because you are sowing a seed the ministry you are about to start you will also have sons and one day they will also go you see so I will encourage that person number one you have served for 16 years remember that happened between Jacob and Laban when he served, he wanted to go. Laban said, you are not going anywhere. Switch wives for him. The guy added, uh, you know, time again and so on and so forth because he learned that it was through him that God was prospering him. Now, let me submit to you. Um, when you are a true father, it's very painful having invested in people. It's a human thing that when you have invested in people and sometimes they are living uh, like any parent who want to do, sometimes you just want to retain them and keep them. This is why we teach in pastor's conferences that you should never have only one person.
doing the greatest task in a ministry always reproduce yourself once you have only one person who seems to be the pillar you are pushing them to the corridors of pride and compromise there is nothing that cannot be reproduced you see so that if and when god calls those people genuinely to go they would have done well to have worthy replacements usually the pain happens when the individual is going to leave a very big vacuum and it will affect the ministry so i always encourage people to develop people don't give people an idea in the ministry that only one or two people are exceptional to get certain things done because it's not true everybody who is trained and is shown the pathway can attain to a commendable level of value uh, for this person i will advise that you seek counsel look for an elderly person in the faith or someone who is within the level of the contemporary of of, uh, of your man of god a contemporary person and meet the person in honor and respect don't go around tearing down your pastor your father no whether he's right or wrong the judgment is unto god don't go around saying this man is doing this he's using whatever it is and then if for any reason you are counseled to leave at the very uh, at the worst case scenario live in peace that means don't tear down people and saying are you not following me are you blind over what is happening here that is not your concern if you must leave you find out you are convicted if you are married and you discuss with your wife you discuss with the systems of authority around your life and they give you the go ahead you may politely live in peace you see in any case do not cause trouble in that church or that assembly because you may seem to be happy for a while that you've gone but i can assure you eventually it will backfire there is no license for rebellion whatsoever fathers are not perfect they are humans they make mistakes and that is the reason why everybody must all together continue to grow and learn but if as a son one who has served there if you observe any flaws there your first responsibility to your father is to intercede sincerely the sons of noah saw their father's nakedness and one went to call the rest to come and laugh at him noah was drunk but when he woke up he was still prophetic to know the person who rebelled against him and it cost him and the other one said no 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 even though it's our father's nakedness he walked behind and he came and covered him it's not endorsing licentiousness fathers are humans they make all kinds of mistakes we owe them our prayer we owe them our support not to laugh at their mistakes and all that they do but if and when living in that circle is causing you to sin causing you to deviate from the pathway the known pathway of god then it may be a wise thing to live in any case live in peace don't cause trouble hallelujah okay um this one is zeroed in on music ministers as a case study but the focus because it's very long the focus is that we're talking about people submitting their soul to the devil yes. and all the stuff um, because I always, I've, I've thought that you're either in the secret court or, in the or you're in the secret place. place. There is That's no middle true. ground. And we, we still mentioned yesterday, um, when he took Jesus to the top of the mountain, he said, which you also said, I think yesterday this morning, he said, bow down, worship him, and I, I, I showed him the kingdoms, plural, which are all the spheres, mm -hmm. and their glory. And he said, if you bow down, I will give it to you. Yes. And there's a connection between worship and wealth, which are things after. So now, the person is saying that we see a lot of people that seem to have submitted their soul to the devil. And they are doing well. But the, we don't see the consequence on earth for many of them. So the person is now giving an example that all the music ministers, that a lot of gospel ministers, they are transformed, they are empowered, but they are not blowing. And that we have, that if you look at nine major, let's say out of ten, People that are musicians, nine will be unbelievers. There are only few gospel ministers have been able to blow. But all these people, we know they are serving devil, but they are still blowing. And there's no judgment. We can't see any judgment. So. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. Praise God. It's a very honest question also. Um, there, 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 are two, there are two ways of dealing with this. Number one, we have to redefine your concept of blowing. Um, that is the first thing we have to look at because when you become a spiritual man the parameters for measuring success change influence uh, influence in the kingdom is not just from a secular standpoint alone so we have to vet what you know and what you propose to be blowing 
Uh, so that's the first thing we look at. But in any case, um, let me submit to you that the Bible says friendship with the world is enmity with God. So when you are, when you are an advocate of the kingdom directly, vocally, especially in the music ministry, um, you would still have to refer to my message on power because the, the system, don't forget that we are contending against an antichrist system that has vowed to not allow righteousness and godliness strive. There are television stations around the world that does not allow you to mention the name Jesus. There are television stations that don't allow you to do some of the things that you're doing, uh, that you're doing for the kingdom. In many regions, they will shut it down immediately. Um, some of these secular musicians have a lot of sponsorships, a lot of aids, a lot of leverage that, that they thrive upon. Um, and then rising by righteousness in a crooked world is very difficult. Are we together? Haven't mentioned that, let me also tell you that success has universal laws. I must be very honest with you. So just because you are a gospel minister or you are a preacher, if you do not walk in keeping with the laws that have been made in the kingdom for rising and excelling, you will fail. And the reason will not be because you are serving Jesus. So while we have, there is a place where the devil's attacks and all of that antagonism against the gospel is there. But I think there are people on earth who have been able to move with the dignity of kingdom integrity and rise to commendable levels. I'm saying this because there are many believers who do not practice the principles that make for global influence and then they use the excuse of the devil and blame everything. Um, I have studied the subject of influence and I pray that God will use my own life to prove that you can rise and do whatever it is that you do in Kenya. Last year, you know, we had a program there and it was an incredible thing, 65,000 people and all that organization happened within a month or so. It, so kingdom influence can happen. And of course, we're all witnesses what God did in the United Kingdom just last week. Uh, and, and it brought great glory to the name of the Lord. So I do not, yes, I do not think that it is an excuse to say that just because you are a Christian, you do not rise. You do not have to compromise. What you need to do is submit to the mentorship sessions that the man of God is teaching. Uh, I submit to you that some of the truths he's communicating to you, if you receive them and believe them, they sustain the ability to grant you influence at a global level. I made up my mind as a man of God that I'll not raise people who are only spiritual, but that I will raise people who are also a people of influence because kingdom advancement happens through evangelism and influence not evangelism alone you see so for the gospel uh, musicians it may be a bit difficult especially when you are starting because in africa there are no systems of leverage that easily lift you you have to prove yourself until you have attained a certain level this is where the holy spirit comes and this is where understanding things like the law of honor relationships and the rest come in so i tell people in addition to your value make sure that you build strategic relationships that can be a leverage for you in nigeria for instance most gospel ministers rise to the degree to which they are connected to a local assembly so the leverage that comes from the man of God, the visibility that they receive, you will seldom find people who are not truly connected to a church just rising at a national or at least at a continental level because most of the invites that give you visibility and the conferences where you'll be invited will usually be from the leverage of church. So it's important for whoever it is that is seeking to rise as a gospel minister to study both the spirituality of music and the industry of music. Hallelujah. I hope I was able to attempt your question. Okay, so I think um, we'll wrap up with these two questions. One of it, I have to take it for the purpose of the fact that I know some people have also asked that question before. Yes. And then this will be the fun. And, and it's about um, people that want to be a blessing to you. A lot of people, they want to bless you. So I have to ask just for integrity purpose that people, a lot of people are ask that question how can we because sometimes you don't know why 
You know, I want to see a person, I want to sit down. I like, look, you, can, you go to Abuja, he's in Abuja, you can't be coming. So, but I just have to ask, maybe you can help give clarity to that. Because sometimes when you go to preach in a place, we get phone calls. And when is he coming? I can't, I want to say, I say, look, we can't, we are not in charge of his program. We cannot make, because you say you want to sit then you come, it's, you start wasting time. So, people that want to be a blessing to you personally, how do they go about that? Well, I submit to you that it's an uncomfortable question. Uh, because of how men and women of God bastardize this issue of um, uh, compromises and lack of integrity, it's made me so uncomfortable. In fact, God had to warn me about, I give a lot of seeds, especially to our fathers, and they receive it, but receiving from others, God had to tell me, other people received my own seed for me to rise. So I must be fair enough to receive seeds from people. Um, generally, um, when, when I come to a ethically, when I come to a ministry like this, I always want to walk in keeping with the modus operandi within the church. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is a personal creed that I live up to. You don't find me come to a church and I'm talking with some people and collecting seeds. I just believe it's not ethical enough. It is my respect and my regard to the ministry that is hosting me. So usually, if and when the man of God allows me to see the people and they are bringing seeds and is aware and they are fine with it, we can speak the blessing on them and receive it. Else, if they have a system where they collate the seeds together and send it, that is fine. But these are the channels. Uh, things like my account number and the rest, uh, I frown at it so much. My friend and brother, Pastor Nath, Nathaniel Bassi, it took him a long time to get my account number and then when he displayed it in Hallelujah Challenge, I wanted to sink into the ground. I said, no, 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 no. He said, it's just my thing. But that does not mean that, um, that giving is wrong. Let me encourage you, not just to me, but even to um, Dr. Lumide Emmanuel. It is very scriptural, especially at programs like this, to give. I assure you that if you do not give, there are certain levels you will not rise to. Um, you can be hardworking, you can be diligent, but giving is the kingdom's way by which the saints rise. So if you are considering in your heart to sow seeds, I can tell you it's not the devil leading you. Um, that's number one. But number two, we have to submit to whatever modus operandi is available. So I would leave that to um, Dr. Lumide Emmanuel. He can be able to guide on however you see fit to communicate. The most important thing is that it is done decently. It is done consciously with understanding, not by manipulation, and it, that it is done with the highest level of integrity. Praise God. Okay, so, so to help you put that in context, if you have a specific seed that you want to sow into his life, you write a check or you put the money in an envelope, and then you put his name on the envelope and your own name and your phone number on the envelope. So we'll give it to him. You don't have to see him. He will pray for you. You don't need to see him for the prayer to work. Do you understand? So don't think that we'll now form a queue. All of you will now be waiting for No, no, no. You'll now be putting 200 naira. You want to see no, no, no. There's no... So put the seed in an envelope. Write his name. Write your name and your number. Uh -huh. And then you put it there, and then we'll get it to him. God bless you. Finally, because of time, we have three minutes more. Um, good morning, Apostle. Please, what will you advise someone who has a call on his or her life, but is finding it difficult to leave his or her business totally? Not because of himself, but because there are so many people depending on him financially. So, should the individual leave everything and go into full-time ministry? Because so it's like somebody that's like, okay, look, it's not even about me now. I want to obey about everybody, my father, mother, brother, everybody is like me. They are doing, so should I shut it down and go into full time ministry? Or what do I do? That's the final question. That okay, we'll that, that's a very honest question. Uh, the 21st century is redefining our idea of full time ministry. Mm -hmm. I define full time ministry as full time commitment, mm -hmm. not just that you are only preaching, except when God gives you a direct instruction that is verified by the authorities around your life and they agree with you that we are witnesses that this was a unique call. I'm saying that because living in the 21st century, many people run away from marrying preachers today, run away from ministers because they have, they have, um, 
they have assumed a template that has made God look like an irresponsible person. There are people who have left good jobs, they've left a lot of things. Now, in truth, ministry will occupy you, it will take from your time. But I doubt that ministry at its infancy will occupy you so much that you will need to leave your job. That is the truth. Depends on what you are doing. As much as possible, I advise people until your job becomes a provable distraction. It may not be wise to just leave your job like that, especially when you are married with children because the woman did not marry a man of God. She married a husband and the Bible mandates that you be a responsible man at any level. I say this because there are many ministers who, who because of their, not, their inability to provide for their families, they find themselves at the corridors of compromise. This is what leads to some of this manipulation because when your wife is crying, your children are crying, and you have the gift of prophecy. Mm. <laughs> you, 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 see, you, you see that most likely um, you are going to use it for a very wrong reason. Uh, you see, and, and you don't want to do ministry that way. So my counsel for such a person is that you can use your workplace to test whether you even succeed in ministry. Because if you start from there, Everybody in your workplace is a potential member of your church. So you test. If it does not work in your workplace, you may need to pipe down a bit. And then maybe I would say this finally. There is a difference between being called and being sent. For many people, be, you are called unto Jesus. You are sent from Jesus to the nations. So just because God has called you, and you are now aware that the call of God is upon your life does not mean you have been sent. He called the disciples and the mission is follow me. When he now sends them, he sends them to the nations. So there are many people who the call of God is true upon their life, but the season of being sent has not come. And so they just release themselves and find out that the backing that should come is not there. You see that now. So it's very important. Jesus said, when I sent you, lackest thou anything? Because if you stay on your call, you will be taught how to prosper when you are sent. Are we together now? So to whoever that person is, and if you are a man of God, and you, are, you know that you are not going to be doing a secular job, attend the trainings so that you have a good business. When Peter followed Jesus, he didn't close down fishing. Fishing was still on. Remember when it backfired, he said, I go a fishing. And the other disciples said, we go with you. <laughs> and notice, when Jesus met them, he called them by prospering what they were currently doing. In John 21, he now made them to have a large cash. Then he said, now come to me. Because he knew that if, if they did not find a sense of fulfillment, they would not come again. So he did something about the fishing. And then he now came and said, lovest thou me more than this. You see that Paul was a tent maker. I can tell you sincerely, if you do not create systems and structures that sort your finance, it does not have to be a job. But you must channel um, streams of income that are able to help you. At the infancy of ministry, um, you may not have impacted people enough to reward you to an extent that you can have money to invest or do some other things. So it's always wise to have a business or have a job, or at least set up a system that you can supervise while you serve the Lord. As God increases you and as you are dispensing that spiritual value, if people keep giving to you, whether honorariums or blessings like this, God gives you the wisdom and listening to your pastor now helps you to know what to do with the monies that is now coming. Because for many people, if you don't have financial intelligence, even if a billion naira is given to you, you will still <laughs> struggle eventually. And you are a very blessed church to have a man of God who loves God and is so thoroughly financially intelligent to be able to guide you to know what to do. I, I, and I tell you, I've read School of Money, I don't know how many times, and I know the wisdom that I have gleaned from that. So uh, for that preacher, I recommend every preacher who is here and has not bought School of Money, go to my right, there is an, the, the, there's the, the book there, go and get it and add it to all the revival materials you have because you will need it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God bless you. Hallelujah. Well, since he has mentioned that, 
You know, on Saturday, I'll be 53 years old. So, I'm a young man. I started early. Last year, I celebrated 33 years in ministry. I started as a teenager. So, we are doing 53% discounts wow. on all my products. Wow. So, if you go and get it now, it will actually be cheaper for you. And the discount expires on Sunday. By the time you call on Monday, uh -huh. everything, even land, 53% discount. The only thing that doesn't have discount is house. There's no discount on the house, so I won't sell house because the profit of the house is not like here. But if you want to buy like anything you are buying, our lands, every estate, 53% discount, birthday offer expires on Sunday. Okay, uh, let me say this, please. Okay. Just to honor Dr. Lumide Emmanuel's birthday, let me surprise him. The first 20 ministers that go to the bookstand, not now, respect, please don't. Be. The first 20 ministers that go to the bookstand, please, they have the school of money free of charge. That, 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 is, that is the support to honor his investment and his contribution but you have to be a minister. You have to be a minister of the gospel. This is not, I know that everybody wants to pick. Some of you will not read it. You are a minister of the gospel, serving in the vineyard. Let me lend my faith with him and, and my support to honor him these 53 years and to support this phenomenal work that he's brought to our world. Thank you so much, sir. So, um, just to finalize that, I always say, you don't go into full time until your hands are full. So most of the time, you will end up stealing or lying or suffering. When you have 12 members and you say you are doing full-time, sometimes it's just laziness. So let's make sure that, because full-time does not mean that you should abandon everything. Full-time ministry means that ministry should be your primary assignment, but not your only assignment. So let's learn to put balance in this thing so that God will help us. Let's appreciate Apostle. Thank you. Hello. Scriptures exhort us from the book of Proverbs. It says, My son, attend to my sins. Incline thy ears to my words. Let them not depart from thy eyes and keep them in the midst of thee. As you have listened to this message, we believe that you are going to reap the blessings thereof if you attend to these words as well. That you will keep these words in the midst of your heart that no matter the circumstance your eyes are going to be fixed on these words and as you have been blessed we will tell you to share this message be an evangelist by sharing to others to be blessed and then subscribe to this channel for us because we have loads of videos we have loads of content that is going to make you blessed that is going to set you on course that is going to set you ablaze and don't forget to like for us. Thank you.